phone I was strung out from the road I was numb and I was tired From that long haul alone Across the room I saw a girl With eyes that burned like coal She taunted me with electric smiles Like lightning to my soul Should have known that she was making witchcraft Should have known that she would steal my soul She asked me for a dance Then she cast her tetris spell Moves and whispers like a siren sent from hell. She told me where the road was and she beckoned me to go. Her body heat washed over me like a steaming lava flow. Should have known that she was making witchcraft. Should have known that she would steal my soul. Should have known that she was making witchcraft. The look of her seduction made the devil dark eyes belong. Could not face the dawn In the early light of darkness I knew what she had done She stole my keys, my wallet And my semi-truck was gone She made me pay The steepest price for passion on the run I should have known that she was making witchcraft I should have known that she would steal my soul I should have known that she was making witchcraft Hi, Tom Davis here with Metatron Power and Light. We'd like to thank everyone for all the positive emails and responses to our music. Our music can be found on Amazon, Spotify, YouTube, and all digital outlets and is featured on Night Dreams Talk Radio with Gary Anderson. We recognize each other in Metatron Power and Light is a band that deals with esoteric subjects, the paranormal, and other topics that engage the spirit and mind. Visit MetatronPowerAndLight.com to learn more. We are facing a time of great change and the future is unwritten. But when we come together and seek answers, we expand our awareness until we begin to see the unseen. Uncovering secrets allows us to develop the knowledge we will need to shape our future and control our destiny. The views, opinions, and representations expressed on the Night Dreams Talk Radio Network and its website are those of the hosts, guests, and participants, and are not necessarily those of or endorsed by the network, its affiliated stations and broadcasts, the management, other hosts, or advertisers of the network. The show is found on the Night Dreams Talk Radio Network can, but do not necessarily, promote any particular lifestyle, belief, religion, political affiliation, or other personal practice. These shows are for entertainment purposes only, and are not intended to treat, diagnose, and or claim any cure of disease or condition, or give any medical or legal advice. 
coming to you from some far point station, like a cosmic tumbleweed, both north and south of the Pleiades. Here's your host, Gary Anderson. Well, good evening or morning, depending on your time zone. This is Gary here down at the compound. I hope everybody's had a great week, a great weekend, and everything. It's I can tell you, I can't wait. We are putting a swimming pool down at the compound. You know where I'm going to be spending most of the summer. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be just sitting there and having one margarita last me all day. Well, you know what? I shouldn't even be talking about water right now because California has declared a drought emergency. Here it is, May. It's not even June. And they are already suffering from the water issue. You know, I remember back a couple of years ago, I went to see my daughter at Liz and Hemet. And I said, to, where's your grass? We can't have any grass. Why? Well, because if we run the water, we get hit with heavy fines. We can't water our grass, so therefore we don't have any grass. And this drought is actually worldwide. Here we have Antarctica melting, right? Dumping millions and billions of gallons of fresh water into the ocean. But here we are going through earth changes and people are in denial but all across this country and worldwide, you know, where they have reservoirs, they're getting down so low. Buildings are appearing. Cemeteries are appearing, even with grave uh, stones. Could you imagine you, you, you buy your resting place in a beautiful grass, you know, cemetery, something beautiful, you know, and then you find yourself submerged underwater in a reservoir. By the way, people drink that water. So, I mean, ah. That kind of really upsets me. Well, they found life on Mars. No, not my ex-mother-in-law, but they actually found fungi. It kind of resembles uh, mushrooms. What do you think about that? Would you go to Mars and maybe make, well, fungi soup, James? Well, my question is, uh, hopefully it's not the magic kind. So then you'd see that little green Martian from Bugs Bunny. Well, you know, even if it was that magic kind, I mean, you know, at least something is growing. And if we have fungi growing that resembles mushroom, what else could be growing in Mars? That's true. You know, a lot of the theory is there's a lot of life underneath the surface of Mars. Maybe there's humans under the, the you know, the surface of Mars. And maybe we are the Martians. Maybe we got it backwards. That you know, I've heard that theory also. And plus, look at all the uh, I think volcano tubes, and of course, there's water there. So who knows? Well, there's ice. Water itself of ev boils and evaporates really quick. Again, I don't know how are they going to really support. They're talking about up to a million people or more on Mars, and you know, eventually we're going to have to if we're humans, our our human race to survive. Humanity, we're going to have to go somewhere, not in to the moon or Mars. We're actually going to have to venture farther out. Uh, yeah, I think we need to try to get maybe two or three to the moon for a little bit before they go for a million to Mars. Just saying. Well, don't worry. China and Russia will have somebody on the moon very shortly. And you know what? In the news today, I don't really had time to read what it said. But they, a bunch of scientists got together, wrote a paper, and said that they have proof for the first time ever that uh, multiverse is real. Well, that is interesting. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Professor Michio kind of touched on that the other night, but there's un who knows? But boy, that, I'd like to read the follow up on that. I sure am going to after the show. Now, who's our guest tonight? Well, tonight our guest is Kathleen McGowan, and, and uh, she is very famous, very successful author. Uh, matter of fact, she is known as one of the world's leading experts on the life of Mary Magdalene. Matter of fact, her latest book about her is coming out later in the month, and she has also studied uh, Mary Magdalene and other related subjects of women in history and spirituality on four continents over 25 years. And she has appeared on many, many TV shows uh, throughout the years also. Oh, yeah. And tonight we're going to be talking about, well, a little bit about Egypt. And then we're going to get into Oak Island in Nova Scotia. 
And a lot of people like myself have been watching, you know, as they try to find the treasures of Oak Island. And, you know, so many people through the years have pan, uh, perished looking for that gold, those coins and all that stuff. Kathleen, I want to welcome you to the show. How are you doing? Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. Oh, yeah. Oak Island. Do Oak you, Island. Do you think they're ever going to find the riches in Oak Island? Oh, you know, the answer to that question uh, changes, I think, every year. Um, <laughs> you know, I started working with those guys um, around in season two, and that was at the beginning of 2014. Um, and I, I was <laughs> I was young and naive then. Um, and I really had high hopes that uh, that we were going to find something and that I was going to be somehow involved with it. Um, and, uh, of course that didn't happen. Um, so, you know, life goes on and time goes on and the Laginas have their own sort of perspective and point of view that they want to follow. And, and, you know, what they do is they bring people in, including me and, and, uh, that have a, a perspective and idea about Oak Island and, and they hear us out and then they kind of weigh whether or not they, they care about <laughs> what our perspective is. Um, and most of the time they discard it and go ahead and do what they were going to do anyway. So, um, seven years later, after watching some of the things that have happened and also having visited them on Oak Island, I'm afraid that I have less hope that they're going to find something. At least in their lifetime. Yeah, I just don't feel like they've gone about it the right way. And, and um, you know, a lot of people have opinions about this. And uh, I feel like, you know, if, if they're, I always go back to the importance of honoring what was there and, and, and the land and our ancestors. You know, for me, there is a spiritual aspect to this search that they want no part of, you know, and, and that's kind of the difference between my perspective on Oak Island and the, the Laginas. The Laginas are the Hardy Boys grown up, you know, they want to find pirate treasure. They want, you know, chests of gold and pearls and, and, you know, things that they can spend. Not that they need the money. It's not about the money. It's about, you know, finding some kind of wonderful treasure. That's always been the dream since they were kids. And, and that's where they are. And so people like me come in and say, hey, maybe it's not that. Maybe this is connected to the Templars and maybe it's a treasure that could have, you know, profound spiritual significance. And they want no part of that. They That is not the treasure that they want to find. And that is so sad, too. And, and And before we get much more into Oak Island, you just came back from Egypt, I believe, for what, two months? Uh, yeah, I've been in Egypt. I was there through December and January and then through all of April. Oh, wow. What is what is going on? I hate to say it with the virus, with the people there. Um, Egypt has really managed the coronavirus very, very well. Now, when I was first there in, in December and January, they were they were quite strict about it. They still are. I mean, you have to you know, you have to have PCR tests to enter the country. You have to have PCR tests when you leave. Um, you can't enter an archaeological site without a mask on, you know, in general, they're very careful. They spray down luggage and bags and everything else. When you enter a hotel, uh, they check your temperature when you enter restaurants and, um, and, uh, at archaeological sites sometimes as well, even, but, um, in general, it's not, it's not such a problem there, particularly outside of Cairo. Um, in the in the more populous areas like maybe Cairo and Luxor and Alexandria, they might they had some issues, but for the most part, like in in the center of Egypt, like some of the places that I was deep in the desert, there's just nothing. There's just nothing there. There's no COVID there. People are still careful. People are still wearing masks, um, but overall, it's uh, you know I I found it very um, very well maintained and contained. Interesting. Yeah. And again, what were you doing there in Egypt? What were you there for? Well, I've been working on a number of projects in Egypt um, for the last couple of years, and some of them are continuations of things I was working on with my late husband, Philip Coppins. 
Um, we were working on some projects about Egypt when he got sick back in 2012, right before he died. And I have in the last couple of years picked those up to work on them again. Um, my specialty being about women for the most part in history, um, I have been working on studying some very particularly interesting women uh, who have been lost in history, who were known as the God's wives. Um, and they were incredibly powerful, like a, like a high priestess type, um, who were married to the God, uh, the God Amun in this case. And these women became so powerful that they were even more powerful than the pharaohs because they could speak directly to the gods. So this is a very, very powerful woman in history to be even more powerful than the pharaoh. Pharaoh had to get the permission of the god's wife or wives to, to do it or enact certain things. And this idea that there was a woman who was having this contact with the divine and essentially ruling Egypt uh, from behind the throne is something that's been lost. And it's something that I have really wanted to, uh, to bring back that story and tell it. So I've been studying that in great depth. Interesting. So I always thought the pharaohs were, you know, the kings of Egypt, but now you're saying actually it was a yeah. woman. They actually, that basically it sounds like they controlled the pharaohs. They absolutely did. Now, this is later. This this is from about the 18th dynasty forward. So in the old kingdom, you're still talking about, you know, the power of the pharaohs. But certainly even then, you've got some queens um, and some priestesses in, in Egypt who were very powerful. But from about the 18th dynasty, which is where we start seeing, uh, you know, where we see Akhenaten and then where we see Ramses, you know, the great Ramses the Great and Seti the Great. During these periods, the rise of women um, becomes extremely important. And this is also where we have oracles. In a lot of ways, this God's wife um, title is an oracular title as well. They were oracles. And so people had to come to them to find out what God wanted, what the gods wanted. And so one of the things that I've been working on in a, in a general sense with Egypt is who were the Egyptians talking to? You know, what, what was uh, the Egyptian religion really about? How were they interacting with divinity? Um, and I think that that's something that that we haven't looked at in a long time. And I think it's time to really bring back some of the Egyptian mysteries. I think there's so much to learn from the stories and the metaphors that come through Egyptology. There is. And again, I wonder if what gods they were talking to. Could it have been maybe E.T. gods? Well, you know, I... When when I first met Philip, we, you know, I didn't believe in any of this ancient alien stuff. I was a, a really big skeptic, and he used to call me Scully uh, <laughs> because, you know, he was very much a Fox Mulder kind of character, and I was his, you know, skeptical redheaded partner. <laughs> um, and, you know, he used to, you know, try to open my mind about these things and say, look, you know, you've really got to start looking at these ancient alien questions. And... I didn't want to, and here's why. I was afraid um, that I wanted to believe that humans built all of these amazing things, right? I wanted, I didn't want anything to take away from the idea of human achievement. So I wanted to be able to say, hey, the humans built these incredible structures that we don't even understand in the 21st century. And that's incredible. And, and this is what we're capable of as humans. And, and his point was, you can still believe that and believe that they were having some kind of contact with other beings. And, and that was kind of the bridge that he built for me, that I could believe that humans had accomplished something fantastic. But at the same time, I could also be open to the idea that they accomplished it by having contact with entities or beings from somewhere else. And then it, it becomes a question of, of semantics and definition. What does that mean? Is it is it an alien? Is it a divine being? Uh, is an extraterrestrial just something that doesn't live on the earth? You know, so we had a lot of philosophical discussions about that. And I, I tend to remain kind of open to everything because I think that having an open mind while doing this research is really critical. So I just continue to gather the information so that ultimately I can put it out there and let people make their own decisions. Oh, you're right. And if you go back through history, man have always had to believe in some type of God. You had the 
the God of fire. You had, you know, the God of water. You had the God of earth. You had all these different gods, depending on your culture. And men and women always had to have that. Without that, I don't think civilization would have advanced. But if what we were talking like before we went on the air, if you really think about this, either this planet has been rebooted or we're living in the metrics like uh, some scientists believe, or we're in a parallel universe. Something created these wonderful pyramids the and the finks and all this other stuff and as we talked about we still don't have the technology to move most of those big stones those blocks and back a couple years ago you know when i was researching because i had a guy on a claim that these pyramids were nothing more than water pumps i called up a company in kent washington (laughs) called flow industries they're the ones that perfected high pressure water cutting of cement, cutting blocks, cutting steel. And they said they, even then, a couple years ago, they said they don't have the technology to cut that precise cuts of these stones. Yeah. The precision is exquisite. It's just, for me, I, I can just spend the whole day just wandering through these temples. The Valley Temple, which is the temple beside the Sphinx, is so spectacular in its precision. I mean, you can't even get a credit card between those cracks. It is perfection. And some of those stones, and we know that they weigh hundreds and hundreds of tons. Um, you know, the li- some of the limestone is is then covered with Aswan granite and these enormous exterior stones. There's just no way that we could do that today. We can't. We don't even have the cranes today that can lift the stones that are in you know most of these temples. Um, so it's you know it's it's such a stunning and exciting question. How did how was this done? But you know, going back to what you just said about rebooting, I think that's really interesting. I, I think this concept of um, have we been rebooted and are we about to be rebooted again? is something to contemplate. And and the reason for this is that the other question that really drives me that I can't shake in all of this, and I, I and I'm, I'm spending so much time on it in Egypt, and that question is, how did we forget, right? If we once created all of these extraordinary things, how did we forget? How did we forget what we had done? How did we forget how to do it? Um, How is it possible that all these things are such enormous mysteries to us right now? And that takes me back to your question about some kind of reboot. It does. I mean, that's the only thing logically when you really think about it. Because of the wonders of the the pyramids, the Sphinx, and not just there, if you go into uh, different other countries around the world, there's things we, we can't describe. I mean, you know, like it looks like li- uh, landing uh, directions for a craft to come and land. We have those things and we didn't have the technology uh, at all. And we still don't have that techno- uh, technology with even what we have to create what was created. Look at the Mayas, the Incas, their civilizations. Right. It, 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 yeah, go ahead. No, and all of these places have pyramids. And, you know, this is this is one of the things I keep coming back to. All of these extraordinary civilizations had pyramids. So that you know, this is this is one of the things that ties them together. You know, we go back to the idea of what is a pyramid and what is a pyramid for, uh, and that's what uh, Philip and I were working on. Philip was was just starting a new book on uh, pyramid power when he got sick. Um, because that was one of the things he really wanted to explore is is what is the nature of pyramids and we have to sort of immediately eliminate the idea that pyramids were ever tombs because it's ridiculous um, but you know were they some kind of uh, communication site were they some kind of a temple were they some kind of an energy machine were they all of those things why are all of these extraordinarily advanced ancient civilizations, places that had pyramids? These are the questions. Yeah, but if you look at all these civilizations, what happened to them? What happened to the Mayas? What happened to the Incas? They're not here anymore. (laughs) Yeah, something happened. Something major happened, and they're no longer here, but we still, you know, I was just reading an article here 
about a week or two ago out in the jungles. I can't remember where it's, it's, it's escaping my mind. They found another pyramid. Mm, really? Out in the middle of the jungles. Not surprising. Yeah, well, and, you know, going back to they're not here anymore. I mean, one of the things that has occurred worldwide is, you know, I mean, there have been there's been colonization and imperialism and oppression. And a lot of these ancient cultures were decimated um, by, you know, colonial figures who also had religious implementation. Right. So. Um, you know, someone who's coming into the Incan civilization, the Mayan civilization, the Spaniards, um, they're going to want to eradicate uh, this ancient religion in the same way that they eradicated their language and everything else. Um, same thing with, with Egypt. You know, there was uh, the, the invasions in the 7th and 8th century, and, and that changed the face of Egypt as well. So there definitely are these periods of invasion and oppression that have certainly led to um, you know, the erasure of some of the things that were what made us truly great. But the fact that none of, none of the information, none of the understanding of how any of these things were created remains, that's the big mystery for me. Well, that's the mystery for me. And again, the, the pharaohs and, and, well, his slaves in his cabinet, yes, they were buried in the pyramids or in, you know, in bombed into the uh, pyramids but uh, it, it, that wasn't they weren't i don't believe these old movies i used to watch well you know the pharaohs had a pyramid built for you know when they their afterlife i think that was an afterthought i really do pharaohs were buried in tombs they weren't buried in pyramids they all had ex, you know extraordinary tomb complexes and mortuary temples and those types of things. Um, you know, there have been no mummies found in the pyramids. There have been no grave goods found in the pyramids. So, yeah, I didn't know that. See, I just learned something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no mummies in pyramids. They're, they're found in the tombs, but not in the pyramids. So this idea that, uh, and, and there's no, there's no tomb decoration. There's no, there's no decorations at all in, in, in the pyramids. Uh, on the Giza Plateau or in Saqqara, except for, well, Saqqara is different because Saqqara contains the pyramid text inscribed in the walls. And that's a very, very important ancient monument because the pyramid texts tell us a lot about how the Egyptians were communicating with the gods. But in terms of the big pyramids in Giza, there none of those, there's absolutely no evidence at all that they were ever used for, as any kind of burial chamber. None. Interesting. And we can speculate why they were there. I mean, again, like I said, I had a guest on who claims that they were nothing more than water pumps, which doesn't make logical sense to me at all. Uh, no. And then one was to communicate to the gods, then another one to communicate well to the beings out there to give them directions to get here. I don't know. Uh, did your hu late husband have any ideas? What did he think the pyramids were for? Well, you know, when you when you look at the the Great Pyramid, I mean, the Great Pyramid, I think, is is the, the supreme achievement of human history. When you look at all of the the amazing, you know, things about it, how it perfectly straddles the thirtieth parallel, and it contains, you know, formulas of you know the the mass of the sun and the moon, and there's so much within the Great Pyramid that is so exceptional in terms of its mathematics. And it's geometrical precision that some somebody or some civilization um, exerted an enormous amount of energy to create something to that kind of perfection. And so that's why you have to say, but you know, what is the reason? What was this marking? Was it marking the center of the planet for somebody? Um, was it meant to be something that um, generated energy in some way? Um, you know, it's, I, I think that the beauty of it is that we, that we don't know, um, you know, Philip's whole thing was his, his book was called the ancient alien question. And he, that's what his whole, his whole gig was questions, 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 you know, what is this? What could it be? Never stop asking the questions. And, um, and, and I think if he had stayed longer um, and we'd have had more time together on it, we would have been a lot more exploring on the Great Pyramid particularly. 
Um, but overall, you know, we know that there's something. Remember in the 70s when pyramid power was a big thing? And- oh, yeah. And you remember? know what, Kathleen? We need to go on break. We'll be back okay. in two, mi- two minutes. We're going to talk about pyramids for a while, Egypt, and then we're going to get into Oak Island. You're listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio. Check out our website at www.nightdreamstalkradio.com. It's been updated today. Not my time. Just because the leaves are dry, just because, just because the leaves are dry. Stay safe, stay indoors, and listen to us. You can advertise your business on Night Dreams Talk Radio, and you will be heard worldwide. Why not contact us at nightdreamstalkradio at gmail.com. Hi, this is Tom Davis with Metatron Power and Light. Our songs are inspired by our own experiences and the stories of people we've met. We know what we've seen and we know the truth. We are not alone. What's unusual about Metatron Power and Light as a band is we share the same beliefs. We've all had similar experiences, and together through music, we can explore the kinds of subjects that haven't been presented in exactly this way before. We want everyone to know that what you're going through, we're going through. When you're being told one thing and seeing another, we're here with you. Music brings people together, and together we're strong. From the compound in beautiful Gig Harbor, Washington, Night Dreams Talk Radio presents your host, Gary Anderson. And we are back here on a Tuesday. It is 7.30 at Pacific West Coast time. Our guest night is Kathleen. We're talking about, well, the pyramids right now, but in a few minutes we'll be talking about Oak Island and Nova Scotia. And we're going to talk about maybe the buried treasure, if there is any. Anyway, Kathleen, we are back. Hi. Yeah. Again, you think about this. What? What are these pyramids used for? What were they used for? And, you know, again, we were talking about the construction on it. I mean, I've heard every expert in the field and everyone has their own idea. But when you think about it, none of it, none of it could work with the type. Even the technology we have today won't work, let alone the technology they had wouldn't work unless they had some type of technology that we're not aware of they it, they had to have there were two there are 2.3 million blocks that make up the great pyramid 2.3 million and f- in order for that to have been built in 20 years they would have had to place 800 tons of stone every single day we can't even fathom how that could have happened so yes there had to have been some kind of technology uh that we don't that that we don't know about or that we don't understand and i will say years ago i've been going to egypt for 30 years this is uh the, this is my 30th anniversary of trips to egypt this year and uh a number of years ago i was there with a sufi mystic 
and he was a um, he was a he was a guardian. He was one of the indigenous people of the Giza Plateau. His family had been there for as long as anyone could remember, and he took us back to um, back past the pyramids, you know, further into the desert where there's some really interesting. Uh, old temples um, that you that are not open to, to tourists, and you would never know they were there if you weren't there with someone who had grown up who hadn't grown up there. So he took us in there, and we we went down into the ruins of this temple that was also made with the same type of blocks that are in the pyramid. And he said, "Now watch." And he started to chant. He started to chant, and it was that beautiful but really intense kind of guttural sound that, that comes from, you know, deep, deep, deep in the throat. And as he started to chant, you could hear, it was the most, one of the most incredible things I've ever experienced in my life. You could actually hear the stones in the temple moving. Resonating, and, re resonating with what he was doing. Yes. So the resonance, the vibration of what he was doing was causing the stones to move. And I swear on my life that that is the truth. I've never experienced anything like it. And he did it for a few minutes and then he stopped and then he looked at me and he said, and that's how the pyramids were built. He, he said, could, you know what? He could be very accurate because maybe it was done by sound frequencies. I think that resonance is the key to a lot of the things that were happening. Um, an understanding of how to move matter and, and, and change maybe the way that, that matter appears through vibration and resonance. That's the kind of technology or certainly understanding that I believe the ancients were, were working with. They certainly knew how to do something that is beyond our understanding today. And I sure wish we could get it back. Well, you know, there was a guy who's no longer with us. I think he was in Florida. He built this, you know, structure. And he, big, you know, no way it could have been moved. And scientists actually think it was done by sound uh, vibrations. I wish, James, do you know who I'm talking about? The guy built like a castle type thing or whatever it was all by himself yeah. and moved huge, huge stones and stuff like that. Yes, he. I believe he was from uh, Lithuania or Armenia or somewhere. But yes, he built a coral castle. Yes, and to this day they don't even know how. And he would do it, do it secretly. And he even said that he mastered the way that the Egyptians built the pyramids. Yeah, see, there it is. Somebody discovered it, and then we lost it. Yeah, Isn't yeah. That you know, Philip's motto was that ancient knowledge will give us our future. And he really believed that. And, um, and I've really kind of carried that on. I, I believe it too. And going back to your, your perspective that we could be, you know, in the, on our way to some kind of a reboot or some kind of a cataclysm that's going to change the world again. You know, it's one of the reasons I'm spending so much time now in Egypt, because I believe that I believe that there is so much to be understood from the ancient Egyptians, that there's so much knowledge and wisdom that is still exists there in the land. And believe it or not, there's still some pretty extraordinary indigenous wisdom keepers there. And those are some of the people that I'm spending time with and, and really trying to get the information that they have had passed down to them for, for many, many, many generations to see how close we can get to really understanding you know, what was going on here. And if indeed this information and this knowledge will help us to, uh, to, to preserve our future. I don't know. The, the thing is, we got the global warming going, which I preach a lot. Antarctica is going. And, you know, the sea uh, uh, level is rising. Of course, you got some people will sit there and, and say it's not happening, but it is happening. And, yes. it, and it's, you know, so many different things that could take out humanity. It would be nice to know and discover what happened during yeah. the time of the pyramids. What happened? Because yes. evidently we lost all that technology. Something caused that to happen. Were we rebooted? Because, you know, I read an article by his name uh, escapes me here a couple of years ago about the Phoenix or the Phoenix that it was underwater, under the ocean, and the wear marks, they figured for years and years it was caused by sand blowing. Well, the latest theory is no, it wasn't from sand, it was from water current being underwater. Erosion, yeah. Yeah, erosion. 
entirely possible, you know? Um, you know, I think that there, there is another, there's another interesting, really extraordinary place uh, in Egypt, about 30 miles from the Great Pyramid, uh, where Saqqara is, there is a place called the Serapium, which was only discovered in the last hundred years and only, you know, excavated and, you know, available to, to enter in the last 50. Um, and the Serapium is this extraordinary underground, um, it's like an underground structure, right, that has gigantic stone sarcophagi so huge i mean not you take the size like these these big stone sarcophagi that you see that hold mummies but make it you know three or four times larger and they weigh hundreds of tons and the they have stone lids that also weigh hundreds of tons and when you put the lids on them they are airtight and they're watertight and there are i think 24 Four of those, I, I don't quote me on that, but there are a lot of them. I believe it's 24 that existed in this underground space. Now, also completely impossible. How did they get these underground? How did, what, did, what were they, but what were they for? What caused people to build this underground structure with these incredible, impossible uh, stone storage chambers that were airtight and watertight. And it says to me that they were anticipating some kind of cataclysm and that they were storing things in there in case there was a cataclysm. So if they were maybe protecting themselves from the flood or doing something, I just, you know, the, the, <laughs> the traditional archeological uh, answer is that the Serapeum is they found some bowl, bones of bulls in, um, in some of the chambers. So they say, oh, well, uh, these were just ceremonial and there were bull bones in these. No, you can't build something that is this extraordinary and impossible just to put a handful of bull bones in there. Something was going on. It was built for a very, very specific reason. And I believe it was built because they knew there was a cataclysm coming and they were preparing for it. Well, the same way we're doing it right now. Our, our government is building underground bunkers everywhere in the Midwest. It's gone crazy. If you look at it, you'd be shocked what's going on. Is there something about in our future that we have to worry about? I don't know, but maybe they knew what was coming in their time frame. Right. I think they did. I think they did. And um, whatever it was took away uh, a lot of the information and the understanding that um, that they had there in the past. And uh, I, I sure would love to think that there's a way for us to get some of it back. And I, as long as there is breath in my body, I'm going to keep looking. Well, look at the stuff here. Didn't they find a whole bunch of, oh, I'm trying to find, I figure the right word, but coffins here recently, a, a whole bunch of them perfectly intact. There, Egypt is so exciting right now. It is, it's such an incredible time uh, to be observing what's happening in Egypt because they are finding things literally every day. You know, the, that, the West Bank of, of the Nile over in Luxor is, I mean, the entire area, everywhere you walk, you are walking on top of something extraordinary. And, you know, um, they just announced uh, about a month or so ago that they'd found this lost golden city uh, in Luxor, and I was I was lucky enough to be there when it happened, and lucky enough to be invited uh, to come and 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 tour the site. And it's absolutely exquisite and extraordinary what they found, you know, from the period of Amenhotep the the third. So we're talking about you know about four thousand years, and um, and they've only excavated just a, a small amount of it. There, they think there's miles of it, and they have it, it's what they they might be able to find things that are are beyond our understanding and beyond anything that they've found so far in in Egyptian history and Egyptology. So stay tuned because I truly believe that there is an energy out there um, of. Ex explore but exploring and exposure if that makes sense i feel like that we have entered this time when things want to come to the surface that there is some kind of an energy whether it's uh astronomical um or just a you know something that's happening in the in the zeitgeist of humanity that's about 
um, things coming to the surface and things no longer being hidden. And I think that we're going to see a lot more of things being discovered as a result of that. Uh, and Egypt, I think, is going to lead the way. I think so, because I, I think if you think again, uh, the Egyptians, Egypt, you, you, the Mayas, the uh, it, all this stuff. I mean, they, I think, were so advanced compared to our technology in so many ways. Well, Kathleen, I want to kind of get in now to Oak Island. Sure. Okay. A lot of people don't realize Oak Island is not that big. It's only, what, 140 acres and it's privately it owned? Yeah, it's not big at all. Um, and yes, it is privately owned. Um, and, uh, but it's a, it's, it's a, it, you know, it's, it's a fascinating place. And, and there is, you know, there's, there's a little causeway that you cross, right. As, as you're heading on to, uh, onto Oak Island officially. And I will tell you, you feel it. There's something really magical that happens as you cross that causeway, you have a very strong sense that you are entering a very special space. And it's it's not something that is, that is easy to describe, but I've heard lots of other people say it, uh, and I experienced it myself. In fact, I was I you know I I consider myself quite sensitive to energy, but um, I was really overwhelmed by how um, how strong it was as we crossed the causeway and I entered this, this the airspace of Oak Island. I was like really taken aback. It was like. Ugh oh, something's happening here. I mean, it really is a very special place. Unfortunately, I feel that what is going on is actually destroying the island in, in some ways, too. I don't know how you feel about it. I do. I feel the same way, Gary. I do. Um, I feel like... I think the fact that everyone, even the, you know, e even those who don't necessarily believe in the spiritual nature of it or, or wants to believe in the spiritual nature of it. I think that um, they still feel that there, that there is something special about the island. Um, but I feel like if it was sacred ground at one time, and I do believe that it was, and that's why I, I believe that there could be a very important and inspiring treasure there. Um, I feel like they have just really desecrated it. I think that they've made a mess of it, really. Um, there's no, there's just, there's just no honoring of the land itself. It's really just about, you know, making, uh, it's, it's about making a really big mess, you know, toward, toward their goal, as opposed to, you know, I, I begged them, like, take, just take a few steps back and, and look at this differently and, and, and look at this from a, a more spiritual perspective. There's something happening here, you know, that, that really deserves your attention. And, um, and they didn't want, they didn't want to hear that. You know, uh, one of them said to me, Hey, I don't want to find your treasure. I want to find our treasure. Um, and, and that was when I, I realized that I, you know, that my involvement was coming to an end because they weren't interested in any kind of approach that, that had any type of, of spiritual involvement. Yeah. Well, it seems like it was, I, I'm not going to use the word, but it definitely wasn't what you were talking about. A, a, again, where did this whole thing start about Oak Island being a money pit? Oh gosh, um, you know this. This goes back to whew, the 1700s, really. Um, you know, this is the. There have been rumors that there is something on Oak Island since since the 18th century, um, probably longer. But that's when we first start seeing um, that there are some kind of stories being told told about Oak Island. I mean, sort of famously, the Laginas read about Oak Island and the money pit when they were kids. Um, you know, the story that they tell is that um, uh, there was a, their parents had a Nash, uh, not National Geographic, Reader's Digest. Their parents had a Reader's Digest that uh, told a story about Oak Island and about um, the treasure and how people had died at various times trying to find this treasure. And um, the, the boys read it when they were young and they became really, fascinated by the story and they used to kind of act it out and, and you know play oak island and um and then you know later on after you know marty's success they were able to purchase actually a part of oak island the majority of it actually 
um, and, uh, and and start the search on their own. So, you know, in, in one respect, it's kind of, it is a beautiful story about their brotherhood and their family uh, and all of that. And I, and I, I do, and I respect that. I, I really do. And, and I, I love that this is something that, you know, they do together and they care about it. And it's, it's, you know, something that harkens back to, to their childhood. But on the other hand, I think that, you know, I just wish that they would expand their vistas and their views a little bit on, on what it could be. Now, I also have to say that they come from a very traditional Italian Catholic background, um, and they are very, very wary of anything that could possibly be heretical. So when I was with Marty in France and we were talking about some of the things that, you know, the Templars and the Cathars could have could have been protecting, including, you know, the issue of Mary Magdalene and uh, her legacy there and the potential that, you know, she was married to Jesus and that there was a bloodline that lived in France, which is a very strong part of the French culture. Um, they didn't want to hear that. That was really scary to them. They didn't want to know anything about anything that was heresy whatsoever. And so um, I think that they just really go like going back to this idea that it's pirate treasure because that's really safe and that kind of fulfills their their early childhood wishes. And that's what they want to find. And I don't think they're going to find it. Well, you know, the one when they first started doing the digging, it was in that one pit that yeah. I, how many people died previously trying to, you know, that pit would fill up with water they kept you know digging i i think there was a couple people didn't they die uh, six, i think i believe it was six and i think they're waiting for the seventh i think isn't that the legend yeah seventh uh, that's scary yeah uh, i i don't know um i think you know the money pit is is complicated and you know <laughs> the money pit gets all the attention right because it's it's it, it's the, the thing that everyone has written about and, and it is quite fascinating, but the fact is nobody even knows exactly where the money pit is. I mean, it's still a little bit of a guess. Um, I think they've pretty much narrowed it down now over these last couple of years. Um, but there's still so much about it. I, you know, I've always believed that the actual money pit is, um, a bit of a diversion, right? Um, I think that the money pit, to me feels like a, hey, look over here. Um, and I don't think that the money pit is at all where uh, treasure was buried. I think the treasure, um, if there was treasure, I think it was it was actually buried in the swamp uh, because we know that the swamp is man-made and I think that the swamp was man-made to grow up around the treasure because we see that that is a, a means of hiding treasure that goes back historically uh, for thousands of years. Um, the Egyptians did it. Uh, the Visigoths did it. They would they would bury treasure. They would dam up spaces, bury treasure, and then release the water over it because they knew that that was the best way to protect treasure. And because the Visigoths did this in Europe and there is Visigoth connection to this part of France where the Templars come from, I think it's entirely possible that that is the, the type of process they used to bury the treasure on Oak Island. Well, you know, again, I'm going to go back first to the money pit. Going down, they have found, you know, wood, charcoal. Mm -hmm. They, I think they found a coin at one point. I think it was, again, I don't even know if it was pirates, how they had the technology to go down as far as they did. Right. Uh, without it filling up with water with them. But we haven't been able to do it. They haven't been able to do it. Now, if I remember right, didn't they go back a couple years ago, that swamp, and drain it? Sort of. Okay. <laughs> the swamp is tricky. I understand that. it's the, Working in the swamp is very expensive and very, very challenging. Um, and, you know, I didn't realize that until I was actually there. And when you're there and you're in the middle of it, you get it. It's really complicated. Um, you know, so, so in that regard, you know, I'm going to credit them. It's, you know, wh where, what I, where I particularly think, um, there could be treasure is a very, very challenging place to dig. And if you, uh, if you don't, you know, if you don't want to find what I think is there anyway, then, uh, you probably wouldn't want to want to do that. And they haven't, but, um, oh gosh, what was I going to say? Um, 
I was, well, the I'm sorry. They, I just totally lost my train of thought there. Okay. Well, while you're thinking of it, haven't they found some type of coins in that that swamp too? Oh, yes, they have. And I'm sorry. I just got, <laughs> I still have a little bit of jet lag because I've only been home for a few days from Egypt. Um, I, so the, the way that I got pulled into Oak Island initially is way back um, at the end of season one, it was they were planning season two. Um, they had discovered the coconut fiber. I don't know if you remember this, but yeah. um, they had discovered that one of the booby traps, right? One of the booby traps toward the money pit um, contained coconut fiber and the coconut fiber acted as a filter um, for the water that was coming through it. And um, it was quite a sophisticated booby trap, right? So they, um, because I was working with the production company on some other shows, I was working on Ancient Aliens at the time, and I was also working on Bible Secrets Revealed. So I knew the producers that were working on it, and they knew that I had an expertise in uh, the French Middle Ages and the Templars and the Cathars, and they called me and they said, hey, can you come in and talk to us about what we have found on Oak Island? And I came in and they said, listen, we've carbon dated these coconut fibers and um, we want to know what you think. And I said, well, if they date back to somewhere to the mid 1200s, then we have a story. And they said, well, they date back to the mid 1200s. So what's our story? Um, and so that's how I got involved. And, I, and it got, I got involved with them in talking about what was happening with the Templars at that time. Now, going back to what you said, Gary, about the construction is really important here because who would have had the information, the understanding at that time to create something as sophisticated as this multi-layered money pit and these extraordinary, almost elegant booby trap systems, yeah. right? A lot of booby traps. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's where I kept going back to, you know, the Templars, the Templars were in the Middle East, they were in Egypt, they were in the Holy Land, they would have, they would have witnessed a lot of, of uh, important construction that was also done in sacred spaces. So, you know, that was a big part of my pitch to believing that this would have been, you know, th these structures would have been built by the Templars or people who were working with the Templars and some or somehow guided by uh, by Templars who understood these architectural uh, and structural techniques that would have come from the Middle East. But yeah, again, on Oak Island, I remember one of the episodes, they found a rock uh, within uh, some type of uh, engraved thing on it. And they mm -hmm. said it was from the Vikings. Um, maybe. <laughs> It, you know, I don't think that's ever been sort of officially proven. Okay. Um, I think there, you know, there, there have been a couple of things. There are some legendary things um, that were found on Oak Island that no longer exist, you know, and one of them is this stone that had, you know, some kind of uh, runic engraving, um, but that stone no longer exists. And so there's, you know, there's some drawings of it and there's some copies of it, um, but it's, it's a little bit... Uh, it's a little bit hard to track because no one knows where the original is. So the age of it is imp impossible to know. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's the challenge. I think the most interesting thing that they've found, uh, which they found in, in the swamp was the, the cross. Um, I don't know if, if you saw the, the cross, they had found that there is a, a, a metal cross that they found um, that dates back to the Middle Ages. And um, they actually brought me, it's one of the reasons I went to Oak Island. They brought me to Oak Island to look at the cross. And, and um, you know, it's television. So what happens is, you know, you spend many, 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 <laughs> many, many hours, you know, putting together, you know, theories and presentations. And of course, you, you know, it shows up for 30 seconds on television. So there's so much that you don't see, you know, that's happening behind, behind the scenes. And, um, you know, so we talked a lot about this cross. I do believe that the cross is important. Uh, I also believe that the cross was important for reasons that, you know, again, they didn't care to look at, which is fine. Um, but I, I stand by the fact that the cross is the most important and it's thing that's been discovered on Oak Island so far. And what was the cross made out of? Um, well, that was the that was the challenge in terms of what the cross was. I think ultimately they discovered it was bronze. Um, 
it was some kind of metal. And at first they thought there might be gold uh, on it or in it. There was not. Um, but there's, there's something really interesting about the way the cross is carved. Um, and it has a, a particular depiction of the crucifixion. It's very, um, it's very crude. Uh, but it's it's very specific in terms of uh, the way Jesus's head is tilted and the way that um, both of his feet hang at the bottom, and it it speaks to um, some specific things that were were happening around the, the period of the Crusaders. Then that was one of the things that I was there to to talk to them about. Okay, now we need to take a break. This break is about five minutes long. So now if anybody needs anything like coffee, tea, now's the time of run and go get it. We'll be back with Kathleen. You're listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio. You want to answer that, don't you? I bet it's just killing you seeing the soft glow just inches away. Someone wants to tell you something or ask you something. Oh, come on, answer it already. <laughs> Just so we're clear, that wasn't my fault. Next time, ignore your inner voice. Don't text and drive. A message from Florida's trusted choice, independent insurance agents. Stay safe, stay indoors, and listen to us. It was the 4th of March, as history goes, in the year 1918. A freighter named the Cyclops sailed the Sargasso Sea with a cargo full of manganese bound for Baltimore to be used in bombs and cannon shells in the raging First World War. Watch the weather crew as they glow, see the Captain Warley was a German citizen. His real name was Johann Wickman. He jumped ship in San Francisco and chose to begin again. Known for violence and enmity, believed to collude with the enemy. He was hated by his men for his rages and pushed his crew to near mutiny. Watch the Miami, Bermuda, or Puerto Rico. Ships have disappeared since long ago. How or why the mysteries grow. Creatures live and die as they will. Some ancient creatures are living still. The Biathan stirs five miles below, bound to the sound of the engine drone. Watch the wearing Captain and crew were well underway when the ship was snared by a stowaway. With massive arms reaching bow to stern, it pulled the craft into a devil's turn. All men together, 
quarrels aside, off the beach to stay alive. But Leviathan brought the Cyclops down, 300 brave souls and a captain drowned. Do you have a paranormal story you want to share on Night Dreams Talk Radio? You could be a guest. Email us at nightdreamstalkradio at gmail.com. You can advertise your business on Night Dreams Talk Radio and you will be heard worldwide. Why not contact us at nightdreamstalkradio at gmail.com. You are listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio Network. From our compound to you worldwide. With your host, Gary Anderson. And we are back with Kathleen. We're talking about Oak Island. You know, Kathleen, there is somebody who wrote a book out. It said that the mystery has been solved. And I just don't think the mystery is anywhere <laughs> being solved. I, I no, I, I I don't know who who that is or what their what their version of of the solution is. A lot of people have written books saying that they have solved the mystery, um, but I don't think that anyone has. Um, you know, there's there's still so much more there's so much more to it, and it really is fascinating. I do want to correct myself. Uh, the the cross that was found in Smith's Cove um, is lead. It was made out of lead. I just double checked that, and I um, I think I said it was bronze. It's not. It's lead. And they believe that it's about 600 years old. I, I do want to give mention to Gary Drayton, who does all the metal detection on the show. Um, he is a wonderful guy, and he's very devoted to his work there. And uh, I'm a big, I'm a big Gary Drayton fan. I think that he's doing good work. And um, and apparently, he found something that has been identified as potentially Roman. You know, there's a a spearhead that was discovered. Um, that they are saying is Roman and could be up to two thousand years old. So I don't know what I don't know where that leaves us. <laughs> oh yeah, well you know, uh, well a, a Roman sword was found. Uh, then they found actual Roman numbers, and then they found a leather book binding, and then you know old manuscripts they were found chain bone fragments, coconut fibers which you mentioned. And uh, a whole, you know, the cross that you talked about. How about a Templar coin? So yeah. something and a Templar, a Templar uh, cross, a cross bolt, bolt, a Spanish coin going from around the 17th century. That is kind of weird. So maybe the island had multiple purposes on that island. Oh, I think so. I, I, I definitely think so. I think that, you know, I think it's like... Uh, you know, we see this over and over again through history, particularly when we're talking about, you know, think places where there have been secrets or things to be covered up or things to be hidden. We see layers and layers and layers, right? So, you know, we have these kids who in the latter half of the 1700s, I think it's 1795, they're the ones who discover, discover the money pit, right? And discover that something's happening there. Um, and I think that, you know, this idea that, you know, there's a really interesting theory um, that the reason these kids discovered something is they saw lights, right? Lights coming and going, ships coming to the island. Um, and this was also during, you know, the the really heavy part of the French Revolution. And so there is another theory that there is a, there was a treasure that was being buried there that belongs to uh, the French royals that was that was taken out of France in order to protect it. Um, from the revolutionaries and that that might have been something that was there once 
and that the reason they knew to go there is because they knew that there was already something buried there and that they knew that there there was a place that they could put it that already existed. So this would indicate that there were, you know, legends or information that had been passed down again through these kind of French traditions um, that said that there was a place where treasure would be safe. And that was on Oak Island. Oh, yeah. And then they also found a Spanish uh, silver ring, which they dated to around the 1730s because of the design on it with the floral. But the interesting thing, what I'm reading right now, is they found part of a ship brace in the swamp. Aha. Uh-huh. I know. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. How did how that swamp must have opened, been open to the uh, to the water at one point? Um, possibly. Yeah. Well, and we know that so much of it's been engineered over there, so it could have absolutely been open to the water. You know, again, the island's not that big, um, you know, and there's been, there's been a lot that has happened there over the course of the last few hundred years. And, you know, here's the thing. I hope they find something. I really do. (laughs) I hope they find more. Um, and I also want to say something you know, to, to to people who are listening and who watch the show, I want to say that the show is real, you know, that what's happening, what you're watching is real. There's a lot of stuff out there that you, you know, I read a lot of stuff on the internet and that says, oh, you know, they're, you know, they're dragging us out because for television, because they have a show and, um, you know, this, a lot of this, some people have even suspected that some of the finds are planted. And I just want to say, as someone who has been around this show since almost its inception and has known and interacted with all of, all of these people at some length, um, they're real. This is real. And none of it is, it's not staged. Um, you know, it, and <laughs> as someone who, you know, I'm fairly critical of the Laginas and how, how they're doing what they're doing, but they're real guys. And, and this is a, a, you know, a real thing for them and, and they're emotionally invested in it. And, you know, so for better or for worse, what you're watching unfold is pretty much the truth. Well, yeah. I mean, if you really think about the type of stuff that they have recovered, which hasn't been a whole heck of a lot, but uh, it, it doesn't make sense. So, I mean, it, it tells me that that island has been visited multiple times uh, by different cultures. Uh, you know, you have the Spanish, you have, you know, the Egyptian side of it, the Roman side, uh, you know, it, the, the sword, the, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of a strange uh, situation. Uh, I mean, w- let's face it. I, I, again, Again, on that 140 acres, I don't yeah. know. I don't know if they'll ever find the, the, the money pit because who knows where it's at? I mean, and what it actually was. I mean, maybe again, maybe some uh, pirates did, you know, put some of their, you know, hoardings, you know, on Oak Island, which right. I wouldn't doubt. But I don't think it's like the big treasure. But again, when you really think about the money pit. The, the elaboration of how it was built, you know, and, and all the booby traps and how deep it goes. Mm-hmm. And again, we don't even know if that is the main pit or not. It, it, the island is kind of mystical, if you really think about it. The island is incredibly mis- mystical. It absolutely is. And, and it, it feels very alive when you're there. You know, and it's funny because it's it's a little bit hard to get the people who are there to talk about it. But, you know, I, I kind of went around to people and uh, who are on the island and have been there for a while and said, OK, tell me your best ghost stories. Tell me tell me about the things that happen here after dark. And, and a lot of them are very um, they're very tight lipped. But I got a few of them to talk to me. And every single person who has spent significant time on that island has stories to tell about strange, strange occurrences. Um, and I had a strange occurrence happen as well when I was there. Um, and so, you know, it's it's powerful and it is mystical. And I think that in that regard, um, at times I almost feel sorry for uh, for the Laginas because I think in a lot of ways they they bit off a lot more than they expected when they took on this project. I think, you know, they, the money pit was certainly fascinating and attractive and interesting, and they wanted to find the treasure that they dreamed about when they were kids. But this whole concept of it, of the money pit being 
of uh, the island itself being almost an entity, you know, having its its own kind of its own life and um, and being a mystical place and, and having all these layers of, you know, of possibilities. I think that is well out of their comfort zone. And I think it's something that they weren't looking for. Um, and, and I think it's too bad that they haven't at least allowed um, those of us who want to explore that side of it that they won't let us do that at any at any deep level because I think that it, there I think there was a great opportunity for all of us to work together on this. I think there was a great opportunity to bring in those of us who do believe that if the island was approached in a more spiritual way as opposed to just digging everything up um, and treated more like it was sacred ground, that maybe it might have been a more harmonious environment. I don't know. Um, but uh, you know, and they, they're not interested in that, in, in that kind of approach. So I think that they're going to, things will just continue the way they are. And again, they have found some strange stuff there. It doesn't compute. Uh, they have found like, well, uh, uh, a ball from a pistol, uh, mm -hmm. a pistol part. It goes back to about 1786 uh, or 1764. I'm sorry. I mean, the, a lot of the things that's been found there, you, you go from Roman to, you know, pretty late. So, again, I think this island was used for multiple purposes. Again, I it is a money pit they're digging for, but unfortunately, they're the ones putting the money into it. I, if, whatever they find there, I don't think at this point they're going to even break even. No. Oh, no, no, I don't think so. I, I think that, uh, you know, in this case, I think that they have to be of the perspective that the quest and the journey is is the point as opposed to the destination um you know that they they're they're getting to kind of live this experience as brothers working on this together uh and i i think that that's a big piece of it for them uh you know and you know bless that um i think that you know going back to the things that don't add up i think that what does add up is that there have been legends about the power of this place for hundreds and maybe even thousands of years. And people have been visiting this place because it was renowned to be an important location. Now, was it an important location before the Templars arrived and potentially buried something there? And is that why they came there in the first place? Or was it the Templars bringing this treasure there that created it? Uh, you know, it's a chicken and an egg kind of thing, you know, which which of these things came first, we don't know. But I do believe that the reason you have so many different types of artifacts from different eras is that those legends existed and endured and people came back as a result of those legends over those hundreds of years. I would like to know the story of how the cross got into the swamp, for example, and some of the other stuff that's been found in there. By the way, there's been reported a ghost on the island mm -hmm. uh, and spirits and even Bigfoot, believe that. You know, I actually, one of the stories that I heard was um, from one of the women who has worked there for years. And she told me that she experienced a creature of some kind that she saw and it took me a long time to get this story out of her. She she was hesitant to tell it and, um, you know, wouldn't want to be identified. And she's like, okay, I'm going to tell you this story, but, you know, I'm not going to go on the record with it in any way. And she told me a story of basically when she was driving um, off the, you know, getting ready to drive off the island and then coming across something that came up to the side of her car um, that was some kind of a large, dark creature. Um, you know, she didn't try to, to just, to really determine what it was. Like she didn't say it was Bigfoot or anything like that. She just said there was something really scary and big and dark that came at her and came to the side of her car. And then she got out of there. And then I talked to some other people on the Island who said that they had also experienced, um, something similar where they saw something that was large and unexplainable. Interesting. Now, how many people live on the island, or at least when you were there? Do you have any idea? Um, I don't know for sure. Not that many. You know, there's, um, in terms of the the crew who are there when the Laginas are there, you know, they have they have a crew of people that, that are, are there and, and run the, the operations on the island. And that's, you know, really a handful of people. It's not very many. Um, 
So, you know, I, I don't know. I wouldn't say that it's maybe more than, you know, 10 or 10 to 20 is from what I could, from what I saw, but you know, I am not an expert on, on, on how the Island is run. I will say that, you know, it's only run during certain seasons, right? In the winter, you know, they kind of, everyone kind of bails out uh, or they live on the other side of the bridge. They don't live actually on the Island. In fact, I, I you know, I think that the, the Blankenships or Dave Blankenship lives there and, um, you know, a few other people, but most of the people live on across the causeway on the other side. Interesting too. I, I read it's a very tourist attraction too, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think it's, you know, I, I think that, you know, a lot of people are, are fascinated with it and have, have watched the show. I mean, the, the show has been the highest rated show on the history channel for years. People, people really love this show and, and they love the Laginas and they love their story and it's compelling. And, and, um, you know, I think that there's been a, a lot of interest in it. Um, I know, I, I, I know that there's, there's a, a Oak Island tours company that you have to, to contact if you want to actually have access to the Island and get tours and that type of thing. Um, but it's, uh, it is, it's a, it's a fascinating place. Interesting. You think they'll ever find anything in their lifetime? Cause look how many people thought they were going to find something in their lifetime. And unfortunately they you never did. I truly believe that they would have to change the way that they are approaching the island in order for the islands to give up its treasure. How would you change it if it was you? Um, I think, first of all, I think that there, I think that this island was sacred ground and I think it was considered sacred ground by uh, indigenous people. And um I think the first thing that I would do is try to find a way to bring in uh, something that honors those indigenous traditions and try to restore some kind of honor to the land instead of just, you know, tearing it apart and, and, and taking from it. I would want to talk to local people, indigenous people in the area um, and initially, you know, create some kind of spiritual healing environment um, for the land and, and really, you know, pay some respects to it. You know, when uh, Alan Butler and I were first, um, you know, talking to the Laginas when we were in Scotland with them, you know, we talked about the idea that, um, about this being sacred ground and about how the, the, the region around the money pit may have been uh, like a threshing floor and that this might have been used for, you know, some of the ancient illusion mysteries and um, and there was a lot of sort of information around the spiritual traditions that could have been there. And that in honoring the spiritual traditions, maybe that would open something up, you know, and at the risk of sounding really Indiana Jonesy here, um, I think that in order to find the treasure, you've got to be worthy of it. Um, and I, I really do. And I, I think that there's something to that. And I think in order to be worthy of it, you've got to approach the entire project and the island in a different way. And I think start that would have to start with having some kind of healing ceremony for the land and for the indigenous people there. I agree with you. And, and James mentioned that FDR, the president of the United States at the time, also was one of the treasure hunters there. I mean, there was a lot of famous people. Yep. Digging a hole in there, trying to find the treasure. I mean, let's face it. I don't know. I I, I hope they do find something. I, I think that might not be what they're expecting. That's just my gut feeling. And, uh, well, hopefully. Well, you know, my theory, um, you know, the theory that I brought to them is the possibility that the Ark of the Covenant is buried there. And that is one of the things that, you know, we talked about at some length. And, because my my perspective is that if something was buried there that was so important that it had to be it had to be hidden with so many different levels of protection that it had to be more than just gold it had to be something that held not just value but power um, and so my thought has always been that it's it's potentially the resting place of the Ark of the Covenant. And I will tell you, the Laginas want no part of that theory. Well, you know, it's either there or it's in the, in one of the countries in Africa, which I, you know, had a guy on my show a couple of years ago. 
a geologist, it claimed, it, it, you know, that there's a, a bunch of monks that's protecting it. In and, Ethiopia. Yeah, in Ethiopia. And so it's either there or the good possibility it could be on Oak Island. Now, you got some books and also a website, I believe. You want to share yes. that to the listeners? Yes, my website is KathleenMcGowan.com. And I'm going to go, I'm going to put some stuff in the next week. I think I'll put some stuff up about Oak Island since we've been talking so much about it. Um, you know, I actually did a, a really, um, a really long presentation on the cross and what I believe the cross could have been that never really made it to the air. And I, I think that, um, that it might be fun for people to take a look at it. So, uh, if you go to KathleenMcGowan.com in the next week or two, I'm going to try to get some of the Oak Island stuff up there so you guys can take a look at it and let me know what you think. Um, I have a book coming out later this year called The Magdalene Way, um, about my research on Mary Magdalene and her life in France uh, following the crucifixion and her spiritual traditions. And of course, um, I am here to say that the 10 year anniversary of my late husband's beautiful book, The Ancient Alien Question, uh, has has been released. Um, if you have any interest in, in The Ancient Alien Question, this book is just magnificent. It really covers so much information. Um, you know, Philip was so meticulous in his research. It's been a great bridge book because it really meets people where they live. It, you know, if you are already interested in the ancient alien theory, it will give you so much more to look at. If you are skeptical of the ancient alien theory, it will invite you in and give you some reasons to maybe take it a little more seriously than you have in the past. So those are the things that I have coming up. Yeah, I believe that book is also on our website where they can click onto it and uh, check it out. I uh, believe it is. Yeah, and again, I, I, I do want to thank you so much for coming on. I do remember the episode where they did uh, find the cross, but you know what? They didn't really get into it at all, really, other than they said what they found, and that was the end of it. I think it's the next, I think it's the next episode. It's I'm on that same season. I can't remember if that's season four or five. Um, because after they found it, they called me and they brought me in a, like a week or two later to talk about it. Um, so I'll put that stuff on my website. Again, when I, when I go back to KathleenMcGowan.com, um, if anyone is interested, they can go to my website right now, KathleenMcGowan.com. They can click on uh, more information and get on my mailing list. And I will send out a notice as soon as I post the Oak Island stuff, which I will definitely do uh, before the end of the month. Well, great. Hey, Kathleen, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. And, you know, I really had fun with you on here. <laughs> I had a great time, too, Gary. I'd love to come back. Thanks so well, much. You shouldn't have said that because we'll line you up and get you back on in a few months. How's that? <laughs> Happy to do it. Absolutely. OK, kid, you have a good one. Thanks. You, too. Take care. Uh-huh. Hey, James, who's our guest tomorrow? Well, tomorrow night, our guest is going to be Lloyd Auerbach. Now, he is a parapsychologist, and he has studied, investigated, and researched paranormal activity from poltergeist stuff to spirits for probably around 40 years. Oh, yeah, that's going to be interesting. And who else do we have lined up for, like, Thursday and Friday? Well, Thursday, we have two guests. First guest is going to be Raymond Moody. He's going to talk about, well, near-death experiences, and he's got many books and, and research into that. And the second guest is going to be Mr. Don Schmidt, going to come on to give his once-a-month UFO report and other things associated with the updates on UFOlogy. And then Friday, well, Friday we've got three things, three guests going on. Actually, first guest is going to be Trey Hudson. He's going to be coming on talking about the Skinwalker Ranch of the Deep South. And then our second guest is going to be the one and only Dr. Richard Allen Miller coming on again to talk about, well, he's always got good stuff to talk about prepping and, and what we can do about that. But in between those, we're going to have Mr. Thomas Wortman coming on for a 10-minute update on uh, UFOs and sightings and things going on about that in disclosure. Oh, wow. So we got a good week lined up. What is your gut feeling on Oak Island? Uh, my gut feeling is I think Samuel Ball, the the um, he was an ex-slave turned soldier. I think he found a lot of it. I just do because he was a cabbage farmer and he turned out to be very wealthy. And, you know, where did he get that wealth? 
I know that it's interesting, but you know, again, there's been so many weird things found there. I really think, you know, from the research I did, that swamp was man made. But what I read, and one person said that it was an inlet, it came from the water, and they closed it and created the swamp. And that's probably yeah, why. That's why they found, you know, the remains of a ship there. They found a Roman sword there. Maybe the cross. It could have came off that ship that deteriorated and, you know, it sunk in it. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. Matter of fact, all the boat pieces or ship pieces they find in that swamp, I believe, is part of what you just mentioned. The, the big ship they might have buried and created a from two islands to one. Yeah. And then you think about the spirits. Uh, ghost on the island of the past, maybe. Uh, maybe the past people that died looking, you know, going through the money pit. A again, that's what, five or six people perished trying to get into that money pit? That, that's absolutely correct. Matter of fact, Dan Hiskey uh, said way back 50 years ago or so that he got taken over by a spirit one night. Uh, he said that on that show. And, and then one of the legends was when they built that tunnel, that they would put people down there, slaves, that they pretty much was going to die. So when they died, they would protect them in spirit too, which was very cruel, but that was one of the theories. Well, maybe that's why they found bone fragments too. I mean, it, it's a weird thing. The technology of whoever did that, you know, to create the, the different layers of that, you know, that cave or whatever you want to call it, going into the pit, deeper as it, they've gone. And they only can go so much because it keeps filling up naturally with water. But even as far down as they, they, they've gone through multiple layers. So when you think about these multiple layers and multiple, uh, you know, traps, and they have found everything there from charcoal to wood fibers to pieces of metal, it, it, whatever it was that was, they were very elaborate. They whatever they wanted. It, either that was uh, to get people off gu uh, go, uh, guard to go in there and look for the treasure, and you know they wanted to make sure whoever goes in there digs the, for the treasure gets a nice surprise. If you know what I yeah, mean. Oh, yeah, they sure did. Yeah, you know I just read an article. It's funny you mentioned that this morning. One of the big scientists thinks that the um, underneath there's a lot of limestone and set up for a kind of a disaster of a giant sinkhole that could happen. Oh, yeah. And it probably will. Anyway, till tomorrow, everybody, I want to thank you for listening and watching on on YouTube and listening on Speaker and Apple iTunes, TuneIn and all the other ones and some of the stations we're on. I want to thank you so much. If you can continue sharing our show, telling your friends about it, ah, I'd be so happy. Well, until tomorrow, everybody have a good one. We will catch you later. Mm -hmm.